and welcome to this week's Lab at Home vlog. I'm really excited about this week's vlog because it's working on something completely different to what I've been working on previously. A few of our community members from the Zodi Lab in the US have been working on some protocols involving Anopheles gambiae mosquitoes and we've offered to try out those protocols using my home lab setup, my Bento Lab and reagents. So a little bit of a background, Anopheles gambiae mosquitoes are the most important vectors for malaria in sub-Saharan Africa. Anopheles gambiae is actually a species complex made up of six species that are morphologically identical but genetically distinct. However, all of these species have different capacities for causing malaria infection. So it's important for vector control strategies to tell them apart. So the approach being used in the first of the protocols that I'm going to be trying out is to extract DNA from mosquitoes that have been morphologically identified as Anopheles gambiae, and then to run a multiplex PCR on them. So that's using a cocktail of primers that amplify the ITS2 region of mosquito DNA and rely on each of those species in the species complex having different amplicon sizes for the ITS2 region. So my first challenge uh, for this protocol is to successfully extract DNA from some mosquitoes that have been kindly provided to us by the CDC. And then to get the PCR to run successfully using the uh, primer cocktail and to be able to show on a gel the banding pattern that will allow me to identify the species of Anopheles gambiae. So the next protocol is looking at knockdown resistance in Anopheles gambiae, which causes insecticide resistance. So this knockdown resistance uh, or KDR is caused by a single base pair mutation in a gene encoding voltage gated sodium channels, which are the target site for insecticides. There is a base pair substitution that more commonly occurs in West Africa called KDR West, and a different one that most commonly occurs in East Africa called KDR East. So my second challenge is to run two sets of PCR, one to detect the KDR East mutation and the other detect KDR West, and to determine whether any of these mosquito samples um, that I've been provided with contain those mutations that result in insecticide resistance. The first step is to extract DNA from the mosquitoes. So I'm going to do this using two different DNA extraction methods. I'm going to use the Hotshot DNA extraction kit and the Dipstick DNA extraction kit. My thinking behind trying both is that whilst the dipstick method is quick and easy and really good for the field because you just um, dip the dipstick straight into your PCR reaction mix, um, the hotshot does allow you to keep and store your DNA extractions. Um, so I'm going to just try out both and see that they work. So today I'm going to do the hotshot first and again I'm going to try two different attempts at the DNA extraction because I have plenty of mosquitoes thankfully. Um, I'm going to do one with just taking a leg from the mosquito but then secondly I'm also going to use the whole body and just um, pulverise that slightly and just see which works best the leg or the whole body. So here's the tube with the mosquitoes in. When I remove the lid you can see inside, there we go, and you may just be able to see up the side the loose legs that have separated in transit. So now I'm going to take my PCR tube and use my scalpel to just try and scoop up one of those legs. 
you might just be able to see that over the edge there sticking out. I'm going to just scoop that into my PTR tube. Excellent. Now, slightly easier bit actually is to tip out an entire mosquito from the tube. So I'm done with that now. Put the lid back on the sauce tube and then just scoop up that mosquito's body into my PCR tube. Let's see if I can get a few more bits of mosquito there. Excellent. And now I'm just going to use the scalpel blade to squish up that bit of body there. Now that I have the legs and the body for all six mosquito samples, labelled uh, one to six, B for body, L for leg, and I've recorded in my lab book all of the details that were provided on the tube, just to keep track of everything. The next step for the hotshot DNA extraction is to add 75 microliters of the alkaline lysis solution to each of those PCR tubes. The next step is to heat the sample in the alkaline lysis buffer for 20 minutes at 95 degrees C. So just briefly, in between adding the lysis buffer and adding them to the bento lab heat block, I've tapped them down to make sure that the sample is completely submerged in the liquid. So I'm going to just close the lid there and set that running. I've just taken the samples off the heat block and leave, left them to cool for a couple of minutes. So the final steps for the hotshot DNA extraction is to add 75 microliters of neutralizing buffer from the extraction kit to each of those samples. So I'm just going to demonstrate on one sample. Okay. Then once I've added that, I just invert that tube several times to make sure that the alkaline lysis buffer and the neutralizing buffer are mixed together. And then to finish off, I want to do a one in 10 dilution. So that tube currently contains the DNA, hopefully from the insect, in a concentrated form. And now we want to do a one in 10 dilution into water in case there are PCR inhibitors in that concentrated sample. So what I'm going to do is take 10 microliters of the concentrated DNA. And add that to 90 microliters of PCR grade water. Again, just invert that tube several times and then label that tube 0.1 to indicate that it's a 1 in 10 dilution. I'm just setting up the first of the PCRs and this is to identify which of the Anopheles gambier species complex each sample belongs to. The protocol for this that was provided gives me the reaction mix to make up and that includes seven primers. They arrived lyophilized, so I've reconstituted these in PCR grade water. The reagents um, that they've used are a bit different to what I use for my bento lab protocols. Um, so I have used our Firepole master mix in place of those. Um, it does say on the protocol that it has been um, amended for that reaction mix. So um, it will be interesting to see if mine still works because quite a few of the components and the amount are a bit different. Um, next time I can set it up using our hot start fire pole, uh, which has the benefit of less uh, non-specific binding, as well as the presence of BSA, if we find that inhibition has been a problem in this one that I'm setting up. So basically I have my reaction mix here, which has the seven primers, the fire pole, and is topped up with PCR grade water. And I'm going to distribute that between my empty PCR tubes. 
and then I'm going to add to each of those PCR tubes containing the reaction mix two microliters of my hotshot DNA extractions, as well as the kit control that I prepared at the same time as running the hotshot DNA extraction. This is everything set up now for the first PCR using the hotshot DNA extractions. I forgot to mention you should always have a negative PCR control, which contains your reaction mix, but no DNA sample. That's to make sure there's no contaminants in the reaction mix. So I'm going to close that. This is the PCR program that was provided um, in the protocol. So I'm going to set that running and come back in 98 minutes to see if it's been successful. While that PCR was running, I set up this 1.5% gel using the 12 well standard gel comb and the additional um, one that hooks over the side of the Bentolab gel box. Now I'm ready to load my samples straight from the PCR machine. So I'm going to load five microliters, leaving the first well free for the 100 base pair DNA ladder. The last two samples that I'm loading on this gel are the kit control and the negative PCR control. I've also left a uh, well either side of the samples to put the DNA ladder on and that means that I haven't quite managed to fit all the samples on from PCR. So you can see in the top of my box here the samples that I have managed to get onto the gel and those six outstanding ones that I haven't but I'll uh, run another gel with those on. So this should be uh, sufficient to tell us whether the DNA extractions and the PCRs have been successful. So I'll plug that in there and set that running for 30 minutes at 50 volts. Okay, time for the grand reveal. <laughs> Let's uh, see if there are any bands. Put that on there. Switch the light on. Oh, ooh, I can see some bands. Oh, whoa. Remembering that I loaded everything in fours, which was the concentrate, the one in 10 dilution, of both the leg and the body DNA extractions, everything has worked. That is amazing. Wow. Um, and there's no bands in the last two samples, which were the kit control and the negative control. <laughs> so I could not actually be happier with that gel. I'm going to take a photo so we can figure out what all the bands mean. Just a little reminder that the bands I just showed you through the light box rather excitedly were for the first PCR using the hotshot DNA extractions and the standard fire pole. And after showing you that, um, and before showing you these printouts, I quickly ran another PCR using the Hotshot DNA extractions and our Hot Start fire pole, just to make sure that the banding was the same and the PCRs worked just as well. And I can tell you from these printouts that actually both PCRs have worked equally well. And if anything, I would say that the banding is slightly crisper using the standard fire pole than the Hot Start fire pole. So I think I'm going to be using this printout here um, to have a look at the results. And the same is true for the um, samples that didn't fit on the original gel. A really nice replication, really neat. So a little reminder of how I laid out these gels. These four amplicons here are for the same sample, the first mosquito. Uh, and then these four for the second, these four for the third, etc. Uh, I have the concentrated extraction from the leg and then the one in 10 dilution, concentrated extraction from the body and the one in 10 dilution and some lovely consistency of these results here. So um, to go through the results, this is the guide that I was given from the protocol to be able to um, detect which 
species of the species complex each of the samples belong to. And I was also told from the labelling of the tubes um, what those samples were as well. So uh, let me see if you can see that. Excellent. Okay. So I was told that this first mosquito here was Nopheles arabiensis. So using this key from the protocol, I would then expect a single amplicon at 388 base pairs. So um, in this DNA ladder here, we're looking at 100, um, let's use my pen, 100 base pairs there, 200 base pairs there, 300 base pairs there, and 400 base pairs there. So because of the thickness of this band, it does rather look like um, the sizing needs to come from the top of the band, which is going to be closer to the 400 base pair band than at the bottom. Uh, so just a note that if I were to rerun this PCR, I would probably do um, further dilutions of the DNAs in order to get crisper bands like the ones on this example gel here. Uh, so bearing that in mind, uh, this should be the single band here, Anopheles arabiensis, which should then be about level with the top band of this because these um, two mosquitoes here are Anopheles gambiae, sensus strictu. Um, so we expect two bands here, 464 base pairs, which tallies because that top band is slightly higher up, slightly larger than this band here. And then a second band at 220 base pairs. So you can definitely see they are in line relative to each other. And then this four samples, uh, four ampicons here are for mosquito sample four, which should be Anopheles caluzii. And again, we're expecting two bands, one at 464, which should be level with the top band of the Anopheles gambiae and then a second at 333 base pairs. So again, relative to each other, uh, they line up. So this, uh, these amplicons here are from Mosquito 5, which were uh, unknown. They were given to us so I could try and figure out what that mosquito was using the banding patterns. So um, because the, the sizing is a little bit off because the DNA is so concentrated here, I'm going to make a decision um, based on the location of those bands in relation to the known samples. So because that um, those top two bands of the three very nice clear bands here line up with the two bands here. And then the third band um, is in line with the Gambier. I'm going to call this as the Anopheles Gambier Clutei hybrid. So moving on to the unknown samples again. Again, we've got that lovely banding, um, the triple banding, which I think is this hybrid sample here. And interestingly, this is a little bit harder to tell because there's a little bit of inconsistency between the replicates. So this one here strongly has two bands, whereas it's weaker in the others. I would definitely want to rerun these again to um, just double check this, but actually I would be inclined to call that unknown sample based on the size of this band, either Anopheles quadrian nullatus or Anopheles meris, because they are considerably larger than any of the bands that we've seen for these known samples. So that's my rundown of the banding patterns from the first PCR. Now that we know that the hotshot DNA extractions from the mosquito legs and body parts were successful and that the first of the PCRs worked, um, the next step is to see if I can also get a successful DNA extractions from the mosquitoes using the dipstick DNA extraction kit. 
So I've done a little bit of prep already for this. Um, I have already taken the mosquito legs and the body parts um, and submerged them in the extraction buffer. They've been in there for about 10 minutes now and I've set up the PCR reaction mix for the first PCR and pipetted it into enough PCR tubes here. So all I need to do now is to take my dipstick dip it into a sample containing the um, mosquito this one's mosquito legs so one two three three dips in there to capture the DNA on the end of the what uh, dipstick and then five dips into the wash buffer to take off any impurities or contaminants and then put that straight into the PCR reaction mix. So this is a really quick and easy way of extracting DNA and setting up your PCR. And then you just get rid of the dipstick, label that tube, so that's sample one, then L leg, then that is ready to go on the PCR. Okay, a little bit of deja vu here, exactly the same PCR running again, this time with the dipstick DNAs. Fewer of them because there aren't 1 in 10 dilutions this time, still using the fire pole in the PCR reaction mix and the seven primers that I mentioned before. PCR program is the same, so I'm going to set that running and fingers crossed this works too. Okay, let's have a look to see whether the dipstick DNA extractions worked as well for the first PCR. The hands! Oh, look at that! Fantastic! Right, so a little sneaky peek um, tells me that the first of the two DNA extractions, which were from the mosquito legs, haven't actually worked as well as for the body uh, for these, uh, which is absolutely fair enough. Um, but the negative control is empty. And uh, from what I can remember, the banding patterns are the same as for the hotshot DNAs. So that's excellent consistency. Fantastic news. One point I'd just like to really quickly make about the dipstick DNA extractions gel is that because the DNA yield was lower using dipsticks than the hotshot extraction method, um, the bands are actually closer to the expected sizes that I have on this key. So this means I can actually, I believe, solve the mystery of the sample six, the unknown sample, because the top of those bands, and you'll notice there's only one band in each, um, actually is above the 600 base pair rung on the DNA ladder, which means that I'm going to call that sample as Anopheles quadrian nullatus. For the second protocol, looking at the knockdown resistance mutations that can result in insecticide resistance, I will be running two separate PCRs. For the first PCR, um, I will be including these four primers in the reaction mix, which are specific to the KDR East mutation. And I'll also be using the standard fire pole because that worked very well for the first protocol. But there's always the option of repeating it with the hot start fire pole if there's any issues. And then for the second PCR, I'll be including the four primers that are specific to the KDR West mutation. And again, using the standard fire pole. Um, I will be using the hotshot DNA extractions. Uh, as the source of DNA for these PCRs because for the first protocol you saw that both of our extraction methods worked equally well 
However, if you remember, I disposed of the dipstick after I had dipped it into the reaction mix. So I am going to be using the Hotshot DNAs that I have stored in the freezer. They are currently defrosting at the moment. Um, and then when it comes to the results, I'm going to be loading the Ampicons from the KDR East PCR alongside the Ampicons from the KDR West for the same sample. So then we can look at the banding patterns to determine which, if any, of the mutations that sample possesses. All right, time to have a look at whether the KDR East and KDR West PCRs have been successful. Oh, wow. Fantastic. OK, so I, I do notice straight away that in the first row, there appears to be a little bit inconsistent see between the uh, replicate samples so that's uh, something that I will have to tackle in my uh, rundown of the results in a minute however that bottom row looks spectacular rather pleased with that and there are two empty wells where the negative controls were so that's fantastic I'm going to load the samples that wouldn't fit onto this gel and then create another printout that I can talk you through so we can suss out whether these samples have these mutations. Here are the printouts of the results of the KDR East and West PCRs. And here is the key that I was provided with in the protocol. So just a reminder that the KDR East and West results are loaded side by side on the gel. So these are all the results for Mosquito 1. These are the DNA extractions from the leg and the body run on the KDR East PCR. And these are the DNA extractions from the leg and the body run on the West PCR. So the control band for this PCR is at 314 base pairs. So you can already tell if a sample hasn't amplified successfully if this top band is missing. So this means that this sample here and this sample here I'm going to leave out of this um, assessment. This one here for the KDR East has three bands. So now if I have a look at this, it means I've got the control band at 314. The next band down is 214 base pairs, which indicates um, a wild type and a band of 156 base pairs indicates a resistance allele. So this means that they have both there. So that one's going to be SR. Here, for the West reaction, it has the top band and only the band at 214 base pairs, not the one at 156. So that means it's susceptible for West mutation. So put the two together and we have final in interpretation of SRE for mosquito one. Moving on to mosquito two, we have the top band, nothing at 214 and then the 156 band. So that one's here, R, R. And then in the West um, reaction, we have only the top control band, so nothing here. So then the final interpretation for Mosquito 2 is RE, RE. Mosquito 3 has all three bands here. So that is positive, positive, S, R. And then for the West reaction, it has the top band and the 214 base pair band, but nothing in 156. So that is SS. So SRSS makes the interpretation of mosquito 3 SRE. Then mosquito 4 uh, in both actually has the top band, nothing at 214, and then the lower band 156 base pairs. So that's um, this one here. R, R, this one here, R, R again. So 
So the final interpretation for mosquito four is R-E-R-W. Hopefully you can see what I'm doing here and the following. Um, On to mosquito five, has all three bands in the east reaction. So that's S-R. The control band and only the 214 base pair band in the west reaction, so that's SS. So the final interpretation for mosquito 5 is SRE. And then for mosquito 6, we have all three bands in the east reaction, and again, only the top two. Oh, so actually the same banding again. So SS, and then the final interpretation is SRE. Uh, so I think that's really clear, really neat to interpret. And I would just go back to our um, community members and see if that aligns with the results that they have for those mosquitoes. It is interesting to see the higher prevalence of uh, resistance alleles for the KDR East amongst these samples than for the KDR West. Um, and that's in these overall results. Um, RE being a resistance allele for the East mutation, whereas actually we've only found one resistance allele for the West. So something I'm also going to ask our community members is whether these samples were collected from East Africa rather than West Africa. That's all the lab work finished for this week's vlog. So I just have a few thoughts I wanted to share with you about these protocols before I sign off. So first thing, um, I was seeing that both of our extraction methods worked, which I'm really pleased to say that they did. Um, the hot shot maybe is a bit more time consuming and uh, resource intensive than the dipstick, but it does have the benefit of being able to store those DNA extractions afterwards in case you need to repeat any of the PCRs. Um, however, the dipstick being quicker and easier and less resource intensive, I can imagine it would be really good if, for example, you were doing these PCRs in the field. Um, and as we saw from looking at the results on the gel, the lower DNA yield from the dipstick method was actually beneficial for reading the banding patterns, whereas those uh, highly concentrated DNAs from the hotshot kit, I would probably recommend diluting maybe one in a hundred, maybe one in a thousand in PCR grade water to get a banding pattern similar to the example gel in the protocol. Uh, secondly, I wanted to see if there was a difference between extracting DNA from a mosquito leg versus the body. I was slightly concerned perhaps that the whole body would contain PCR inhibitors that would prevent those PCRs from working. That turned out not to be the case. Um, both extractions performed equally well in the hot shot. Um, the body extractions performed better than the leg for the dipstick. Um, so that, again, if you're doing this in the field, I can imagine it would be much easier to bung the whole body in rather than faffing about with tweezers and uh, trying to pick up individual legs. Thirdly, um, I found the PCR programs uh, very adaptable and robust, considering that uh, really the reaction mix that I used was totally different to the reaction mix that they'd been adapted for. I'm very impressed that they all worked first time. Um, I, the standard and the hot start fire pole worked equally well for me. I would note that my kitchen at the moment is quite cold because it's um, March here. Again, if you were doing this in the field, um, perhaps in sub-Saharan Africa, the temperature is going to be considerably higher than my kitchen in March. So you may want to choose the hot start fire pole um, if you're going to go with, you know, a fire pole master mix tool, because uh, the heat activation of the polymerase means that you can actually set those PCRs up at higher temperatures, not trying to worry about keeping everything refrigerated, and your PCR has a chance of still working, whereas that is less the case for our standard 
fire pole. So that's really good to know that the banding pattern was the same for both. And then finally, I found, and hopefully you did too, those gels really easy to interpret results from using the keys provided in the protocols. So all in all, I really enjoyed that uh, testing those protocols from start to finish. I'm absolutely thrilled that everything I worked, every combination worked. Um, and I'm really happy to be able to uh, send those results back to our uh, community members and uh, hopefully everything that I got matches up with the results that they have on record. So again, thank you very much for watching and if you have any questions, please comment them below this vlog and I'll get back to you.